Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the sixth in the series of HMI DARE seminars. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea, and sky. So today we have um, another Harvard PhD. Um, Electra Bietti is going to be talking to us um, about from ethics washing to ethics bashing. Um, as usual, we're going to keep the introductions short and get straight into the talk. We'll have about um, half an hour for the talk, then we'll go to Q&A. Um, we'll have a, a link up in the chat so that you can join the Slack for discussion afterwards. Um, but for now, Electra, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking it away. Hello everyone, I'm going to try and get this presentation opened. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much to Seth and Shell for organizing and for inviting me. Um, so hopefully you can now see my presentation. So I'm going to be talking about a paper that got published recently that I presented at Fat Star 2020 in Barcelona. Um, and there's a new version of that paper that I'm still working on that will be part of an edited collection of essays on the ethics of technology more generally. Um, so the argument might slightly diverge from the one you can see in paper uh, in, in published version on the ACM uh, repository. So um, I guess the idea for this paper starts from a reflection around the hype um, uh, that has been hitting the ethics of AI and the ethics of technology, um, lots of funding, lots of attention, lots of people claiming expertise in the field, and yet um, very little conceptual clarity around the notion of ethics, what we all mean by ethics, what ethics can do for us, uh, uh, whether ultimately we can rescue it from corporate um, appropriation of the term ethics for potentially unethical practices. And so one of the things that I see happening is that there's a sort of like separation or gap between the way um, ethics is being talked about and what ethics is said to be. So often it's understood as this neutral and acontextual methodology that produces truth no matter where um, uh, the people producing those truths are situated. Um, or at other times, ethics is seen as a self-interested rhetoric being deployed inside uh, companies or by companies or through company funding. On the other hand, I believe ethics can be something else. Um, I think ethics can be a capacious methodology for evaluating in principled ways uh, political disagreements about technology, but also society and our political institutions more generally. Um, so the aims of this paper are mainly to acknowledge and understand the possibilities of moral and political philosophy um, and understand it as a capacious, contextually meaningful uh, method um, that can allow us to do three things. So first, it can help us understand what is currently wrong um, with ethics as deployed or used or understood today. Secondly, it can help us articulate or reimagine um, the institutions, and the institutional framework that would allow us to move perhaps past the notion of corporate ethics um, and towards uh, governance of technology and of artificial intelligence in ways that are uh, socially meaningful and potentially more just. Um, and third, uh, this paper aims by recognizing the possibilities of moral and political philosophy to celebrate methodological plurality. So I'm not attempting to say moral philosophy or moral philosophers are a truth uh, providers and we need to all listen to moral philosophers but I'm actually saying moral philosophy is one methodology one method for truth seeking that must be combined to other kinds of uh, knowledges and understandings of the world and of the social good 
So the outline for this talk is I'm first going to very briefly define ethics and moral philosophy, or at least the way that I conceive of them in the paper. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you know we could we could spend a whole day on on this question or perhaps years. Um, then I'm going to provide some background on the rise of technology ethics and the critiques of ethics washing. Um, thirdly, I am going to elaborate on those critiques and um, explore some of the limits of those critiques uh, in the form of what I call ethics bashing. I will then ask what moral philosophy can actually do for us and what are the limits of moral philosophy. So how should we understand the special role and the special place of moral philosophy in thinking about the role of technology in society. I will then use those insights to try and assess ethics washing and corporate ethics through a moral philosophical lens. And I will finally point the way towards a renewed understanding of moral philosophy and a general reflection on where we should go next. So first, what is ethics and what is moral philosophy? So very often, or um, a lot of philosophers distinguish between ethics and morality. Um, you know, we could spend a lot of time thinking about what these two notions actually mean and how they differ. And I actually, in the paper, I actually take them as coextensive. And I largely want to focus on what I call moral philosophy, but also political philosophy as kind of one broad understanding of a methodology that is, um, some would say rational, others would say principles, but it's a mode of thinking and evaluating disagreements um, that are value-based, so grounded in understandings about the world um, that relate to technology, politics, institutions, and more generally human life. Um, so now let's move to the rise of tech ethics. So the awareness that technology is embedded in society and somehow affects society is an effect and is affected by society is absolutely not new. Um, so political economists in the 19th century uh, started grappling with the role of tech uh, technologies, technological development in the economy during the first and second industrial revolutions. People like Louis Mumford um, theorized the ways in which techniques and technologies were influencing and determining certain practices in society. And then later in the 20th century, people like London Winner, but also Bernard Latour and many other STS uh, thinkers started um, reflecting on the dual relationship between technology and society. So on the one hand, society shapes the kinds of technologies that we have. And on the other hand, the technologies we have shape the society we will have. And um, what AI has done is it has brought back to the center those STS reflections and renewed curiosity and awakening to the idea that um, there are values that we encode in those algorithms, in those machine learning models, and that those models that we think are neutral and scientific and apolitical actually have real world effects on people. And so basically what we started thinking again about, and I'm not saying AI is kind of, you know, the trigger that first prompted us to rethink those thoughts, but AI has definitely been uh, an awakening or a, a kind of a resonating uh, bell for us to rethink um, some of the biases and some of the power structures in our society and how tech could perpetuate and encode them into our futures. And, um, and so that acknowledgement uh, prompted the need for a reintroduction of the social into thinking about technology. And then a big question there is why, why did we start talking about ethics so much and why the ethics hype when we could also talk about sociology, we could talk about anthropology, history, psychology, etc. cetera. Um, and I want to say, obviously, ethics is one amongst a huge constellation of ways of thinking about the social good. Um, 
But critics have justifiably asked why, why ethics and is there a political motive behind the prioritization and the importance that has been placed on ethics in relation to AI. Um, and so some of the critiques have taken the following forms. Um, ethics is a mere rhetorical move may aimed at reputation washing, and there derives the notion of ethics washing, which uh, is generally said to be coined by Ben Wagner. Ethics enables um, deep-pocketed, well-funded companies or governments or act or private actors to shape discourse through um, fueling kind of a language of principled thinking uh, that is actually political. Ethics can be a way of preempting and avoiding law and regulation. Ethics is um, an excessively formalistic methodology that enables uh, the legitimation and normalization of certain pre-existing power structures. So by using the language of ethics, by hiring a philosopher, by making a philosopher um, infer or rationalize certain norms, we are acting as if those norms were true or ethical when in fact we are just normalizing power structures. Um, and so um, I think um, what we can take away from those critiques is they're really important um, and legitimate. And I think we need to take them seriously. But one reason that prompted me to write this paper was that very frequently um, some of those critiques are taken from very um, uh, articulate and nuanced thinkers and kind of um, transposed into a political context in which uh, people then have an overbroad tendency to bash everything that is ethics. And so um, I think, uh, so, and, and I call this ethics bashing. And I think what it is, is it's a failure to recognize that moral philosophy can have a special role or a, a special meaning or a special methodology to contribute to thinking about technology and society. And that that special role actually is important within a constellation of other methodologies and should not just be dismissed because of its potential to be instrumentalized by corporate actors or others. Um, and what I call ethics bashing comes in two main forms, or at least those are the forms that I've identified. One is the tendency to conflate the ought and the is. So moral philosophy for a moral philosopher or for a participant in the exercise of thinking about moral principles mm, is an ought, it's aspirational. It's about trying to understand society and trying to posit ground truths. And sometimes that attitude, which is I think extremely valuable and should be preserved, is conflated with a descriptive uh, practice of ethics, or ethics as an institution, as a corporate or political strategy, or ethics as a self-regulatory strategy. So that's one way in which ethics bashing comes about, is by through the conflation of the is and the ought. And secondly, another thing that can be seen in the literature, or on Twitter, or uh, in general, is um, sharp dichotomies between ethics and other things such as law, justice, or politics. And the failure to recognize that ethics is actually a method and a uh, principled way of informing and guiding the law, justice, and politics. And that ethics is intrinsically related to law, to justice, and to politics. And if we don't understand the role of moral philosophy or political philosophy in thinking about law, justice, or politics, we're not really going anywhere. Um, so yes, yeah, so ethics can actually be something meaningful and we should recognize the special role of ethics and moral philosophy in informing law, justice, and politics and how connected ethics is to these uh, reflections around legal and political institutions. 
And the second insight um, that we can take away and uh, one reason why we need to uh, resist ethics bashing is that ethics is everywhere. And when thinking about the place and role of technology in society and of AI, we should always understand ourselves and situate ourselves within some ethical conception of the world, some view that actually is part of a vision of what morality or society entails. Um, and so we cannot actually criticize ethics without actually taking a stance that is an ethical stance. But all this said, I am going to now uh, focus on some of the benefits and limits of moral philosophy. So what moral philosophy can do for us and what it cannot do for us. And this is partly aimed at an audience that is not an audience of philosophers and moral philosophers, but it's also aimed at um, trying to create a dialogue between non-philosophers and philosophers about the potential boundaries and limits of philosophy but also the potential of philosophy. So what a philosopher can bring to the table um, if you invite him right, or her. Um, so limits, the limits of moral philosophy, there are lots of limits. And um, the way that I want to frame this is how should we criticize moral philosophy as a discipline instead of bashing it? Um, how can we um, be critical of moral philosophical work in ways that can help um, and can be constructive for ethicists and moral philosophers themselves. So first, uh, moral philosophy or political philosophy or philosophy in general is often said to be abstract, to be inaccessible, to be unsuited to technological environments that are instead fast-paced, dynamic, political. Um, and I think it is a fair criticism, but it's also very important, especially today as we grapple with huge questions around the meanings of race, gender, justice, um, inequality, uh, to actually stop and think more about what do we mean by these concepts and notions. And that's the role, that's what philosophers do. And so perhaps we actually need more of that slow paced thinking and more of that abstract or non-directly politicized thinking um, in technology and technology policy. Second criticism is that moral philosophy often um, is formulated in terms of high level principles, but doesn't go far enough prescriptively. It's not concrete enough. And so those are criticisms that are often leveled uh, at work around the trolley problem and how the trolley problem can apply or can inform um, policy around AI and autonomous vehicles, for example. Or um, this criticism is leveled against uh, codes of principles on AI. And I think uh, this criticism actually has value, and I do think philosophers should be more ready to engage in the kind of actual implications of the principles that they formulate, because it is true that high level principles can be misused. Um, so then my third point is exactly this, which is that when applied in context, philosophical ideas that are otherwise abstract can actually cause harm and that context matters. And so I think um, we cannot take the conclusions or prescriptions of a philosopher as true per se, because philosophers are humans embedded in contexts. And so when we think about the role of philosophy in formulating real world political effects, I think we need to think about philosophy as we think about all other things. It is contextual and it is situated. Um, a fourth kind of criticism of philosophy and moral philosophy, which is widespread, is that philosophy and moral philosophy in particular normalize power. So they entrench certain background norms and make them normal. Um, and I think here um, we come to a point where we can see the tension or the potential tension between disciplines like anthropology and sociology and how those disciplines understand ethics. 
and the way philosophers, on the other hand, understand ethics. For philosophers, norms might be in the background, but the exercise of a moral philosopher is precisely to go rescue those background norms and bring them to the foreground and contest them. So for philosophers, norms are malleable and, in, and inherently contestable, and there's nothing rigid or normalizing about those values and norms. They are things that need to be discussed. They are things that need to be uh, understood. They are things that we need to be able to disagree about in the open in a clear way so as to actually resolve some of these uh, problems uh, surrounding the question of power as well. Fifthly, a limit of moral philosophy is that it can be seen to create appearances of objectivity for ideas um, or doctrines that are actually subjective. And uh, here I think it's very true that that can happen, but it's also true that good philosophy is humble and is clear about its porosity and its limits and about what it can do and what it cannot do. So all these criticisms can become encouragements uh, directed at philosophers to engage in their work in a way that becomes more helpful for policymakers to then incorporate their insights. So now let's turn to the benefits of philosophy and what moral philosophy can actually do for us. And I think it can do four things, and I'm going to try and run through it. I don't know if I have time uh, or how much time I have. Um, I'm no longer seeing Seth, so I don't know. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll paste through. Um, so four benefits. Um, first, moral philosophy is a clarificatory methodology. It enables a meta-level viewpoint from which one can observe and articulate the values at stake or the disputes at stake without necessarily uh, taking part in those disagreements or, or um, take part in favor of certain values or against others. Secondly, moral philosophy is an explanatory mode of argument. Um, so in that sense, it's different from manipulation or emotional persuasion. Um, it's supposed to be a principled, dialectic, um, rational method for adjudicating disputes. I, I say rational in brackets because I know that some people resist the, the rationality uh, idea and I don't necessarily, I'm not committed to the idea of rationality. I just want to say that it's a way of bridging uh, different modes of thinking and trying to reason through uh, these different modes of thinking. Thirdly, and I think importantly, moral philosophy is not just about processes and um, scrutinizing and evaluating, for example, how representative or diverse an ethics board within Google might be, but it's also a methodology that allows us to question notions of substantive equality. What is substantive equality and what does substantive equality actually require? Does it require an ethics board or does it require a completely different institution or might it require a completely different governance framework? Um, so I think philosophy can move us from procedural matters to substantive matters. And I think that's really an important role that philosophy can play. And finally, philosophy in a polarized um, world riddled by ideological conflict, uh, philosophy can encourage the building of common ground and empathy and can allow us to bridge some disagreements that might otherwise seem unbridgeable. So taking these insights on what moral philosophy can actually bring to the table and its special role and value in um, thinking, deliberating, discussing, evaluating the role of technology in society, one of the things I do in my paper is I use the methodology of moral philosophy to assess corporate ethics practices. Um, obviously at a kind of ra relatively high level, but I try to formulate some principles for thinking about the wrongness or the acceptability of corporate ethics practices. And the main way in which I do this is by um, looking at the two ways of valuing ethics and ethics efforts. Uh, so first, ethics can be valued for its effects. So that's the instrumental value of ethics efforts. 
Uh, for example, ethics can bring about a potentially better society, um, a better understanding of the issues at stake, or profit for a company. So it brings something and it is valuable because of the things it can bring. Secondly, um, ethics can be valued in itself, uh, intrinsically. And um, that is the value that ethics has for the participants in the exercise of moral deliberation, of moral commitment. Um, the value in the exercise of reasoning and thinking itself being meaningful independent of the effects that it has. And um, so thinking about these ways of framing um, the value of ethics in relation to corporate practices, I believe um, that corporate ethics has very little instrumental value insofar as its main impact is often, and I don't want to say always, to benefit the companies that fund, commission those efforts, um, and the reputation and profits of those companies. And only secondarily and incidentally do these efforts actually benefit the public. Um, and insofar as that is the case, we are not using ethics in an instrumental way to benefit society um, because there might be other ways of doing ethics that might benefit society more in an instrumental way. Secondly, corporate ethics has very little intrinsic value if performed within the walls of a corporation, for example. And that is because the individuals, the people who are engaging in those efforts are actually limited in what they can do and in the kinds of conclusions that they can formulate by uh, their hiring contracts, by uh, the kinds of constraints that are placed on their mandates. And so it cannot be a disinterested, capacious exercise insofar as it's actually situated within a political context that has very strong interest in affecting the way technology policy actually develops. And finally, even if we were to recognize that corporate ethics has a lot of instrumental and intrinsic value for society, I think there is a final concern that we need to take into account, and that is an epistemic concern that has to do with the fact that private actors are actually using instances of something that appears sacred, that appears good. Um, they're using the language of something that is valuable to hide or legitimate practices that might in fact not be ethical at all. And that has diluting or corrupting effects on the notion of ethics overall. And so that means that if ethics is misused too many times, it ends up becoming counterproductive for society to use that term. So we should resist corporate ethics in practice is one of my conclusions. So finally, my last slide, um, we need to move beyond ethics bashing uh, but we also need to move beyond ethics washing. And we need to be able to both criticize ethics washing and at the same time understand and recognize the value of ethics and moral philosophy as capacious principles methodologies for evaluating, contesting, disagreeing on AI-related law, policies, and institutions, but not only AI-related, right? It could be any technologies and their role in society. Secondly, we need to acknowledge that moral philosophy and its value are contextual and there is no such thing as a neutral exercise that leads to absolute universal truths, but that we need to consider the political nature or the political role that some philosophers might be playing, but at the same time recognize that what they do has some value and can have value. Thirdly, um, we have to recognize that there's no escape from ethics um, because we're always doing ethics. We're always thinking about some way or other in which our behavior, our choices might affect society or might be ethical or unethical, both in our personal lives and in our jobs and in society more broadly. Um, but we also need to recognize that ethics is not an end-all, and it's not the only way of thinking about the social good. 
And so we need to embrace methodological pluralism. And finally, um, we need to, so this is kind of my only prescriptive um, demand in this uh, paper, which is that we need to try and isolate ethics, the notion of ethics, ethics practices, engagement in thinking and in moral philosophy from corporate influences, from corporate funding. And we need to try to reinvent institutional structures and configurations that could enable more meaningful, capacious, and humble reflections and thinking around the impacts and the future of AI and any other technologies. Thanks. Yeah, um, that, that was our, our sort of version of a round of applause. That was fantastic. Thank you, um, Electra. That was really great. Um, I, uh, I have so many, so many thoughts and so many questions. Um, the, I, I, most, most of which involve just saying, yeah, and, yeah, and, um, you know, because uh, this is something I've, I think you, you really nailed beautifully. Um, I noticed in the, among the attendees, there's loads of people with um, a lot of expertise here. So let me just um, emphasize to folks in the attendees part of this, um, please do put your questions in the Q&A um, and I'll make sure to get to them. Um, we're going to start um, with uh, a question from, so in the spirit of methodological pluralism from a sociologist, Jenny, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Um, uh, hi, uh, I'm Jenny. Um, thank you so much for an excellent talk that was uh, fantastically delivered and the points really resonated with a lot of what I think many of us here think about. So thank you um, for that. My question has to do with um, your point of differentiation for philosophy from other disciplines. Um, so I'm a sociologist, and so one of the, the points that you made was that what, dif what distinguishes philosophy is your treatment of norms, and in particular that you highlight them, bring them to the fore for the purpose of adjustment because you view them as malleable. And as you were sort of making that point and making your broader points, you sounded a lot to me like a sociologist. And so, and so I wonder if maybe there's more shared space in that kind of disciplinary Venn diagram rather than distinctions. And if so, I wonder if, um, I wonder if there's more value in thinking about sort of transdisciplinary collaboration as opposed to spending a lot of energy sort of defining why one discipline is more effective or differently effective than the others. Yeah, so it's an excellent question and I would be fascinated to try and find ways where methodologies can be, can converge and can be combined. Um, so I'm not a sociologist and I have very limited knowledge on the literature on ethics by sociologists, but from what I've seen, for example, I've been reading Zygon, mm -hmm. um, which, is fat, which to me was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I remember that one of the ideas was that there's a moment of ethical breakdown that is a moment that we need to focus on um, because that's when values are being reconsidered in society and that's when actually ethics is happening. Um, but then what happens after the, 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 the ethical breakdown is everything goes back to normal. And I think I, the difference between the way a philosophers would think about this and the way a sociologist would think about this is that for a philosopher, there is no normal moment when everything goes back, right, to like to settled um, normalization. But it's always an effort of trying to think, overthink what we are not thinking about. Um, and I guess I know that it's same, I, I can totally see what you say about the fact that a lot of anthropology and sociology is also about trying to kind of uh, render visible the structures on which we exist, the power structures, the, the biases that we have. So in many ways, it's extremely similar. Um, I guess, so one differentiation historically, and I don't think it needs to be the case in the future, is perhaps the emphasis on power that uh, has been missing uh, from a lot of moral and political philosophy. 
um, because there is this um, understanding that everything is forward looking, we take what we have and we just move forward. And I think that is a limit actually of a lot of philosophy. Um, but the thing I want to push back is um, criticisms of formalization necessarily as being bad per se, because I do think that we need some form of formalization sometimes. I don't think always, but sometimes. Um, and I also think we need some forward looking thinking, right? So, yeah. So just, I, I have a, just a quick thought on that as well. I mean, fundamentally, um, philosophers um, who work on this stuff um, start out from assuming that what they're doing is going to be normative and that they're trying to figure out what we ought to do, like you said, Electra. Um, and most of the approach taken by the other disciplines has the, the sort of the normative content is assumed and then the, the rest is descriptive. Um, so although there may be, you know, there are often sort of deep normative commitments, for example, in sociology, um, it's, it's not that there's a sort of a, an extensive part where the normative commitments are justified and then there's the, the elicitation of the, the descriptive part. Um, it's the, the normative commitments are shared, and you and I generally have talked a bit about this before, the sort of, the, uh, the kind of reflexive left-wingishness of, um, of so much sociology. Um, and, and they're not really kind of expanded upon or expanded. And I think you get a lot of that in the critical data studies literature, um, where, you know, because one knows the audience shares the same normative views, one doesn't need to defend them. Um, but that leads to some really interesting phenomena, at least to... Um, a really kind of widespread um, absolutism, for example. Uh, and one of the values of sort of deep normative inquiry into why we should believe these things is it gives you also a sense of like, how much they're worth, um, which means that if you then have to make a trade-off, you can do so in a principled way um, rather than um, kind of just, you know, kind of table thumping and not really being able to make those sorts of trade-offs. So. Um, I think that that's where, that's where whatever, it, the stuff that philosophers do is something that needs to be done. It can be done, it's done by everybody, it's not just done by philosophers. Um, but hopefully we're, we're particularly good at it, otherwise what the fuck are we doing with our time? Um, um, so Electra, let me just um, uh, raise a question for you, a sort of a pair of questions from the, um, from the discussion in the chat and the Q&A box. Um, I'll, I'll give you them both and then I'll tie them together for you. Um, so one um, is from Joe Ford, who's a, a lawyer at ANU, um, who's worked a lot on sort of different modes of regulation, sort of the, the relationship between self-regulation and, um, and legal regulation. Um, and he's asking if, if um, you're assuming that the legitimation motive is always disingenuous uh, when it comes to corporate ethics routines. Um, and he's asking, and I think he's sort of, it's a, it's a leading question, uh, whether there are some sectors and products where there is actually a competitive advantage from showing engagement in principled methodologies. Um, so where it's not just a matter of ethics washing, it's a matter of you actually do, things do improve, you get, you get um, your, your profits will go up if you are more trustworthy and reliable. That's the one part. Another question from David Danks at Carnegie Mellon. Um, is uh, you, you, you mentioned this idea about having ethics free from corporate influences. Um, how, like how do you think we can influence um, the design of new technologies, especially around data and AI, um, when so much of the cutting edge scientific research um, is within those companies? Um, it may be a challenge in this context to make a substantive difference to what tech is being built um, if um, we're working only from within the academic sector um, without those sorts of um, corporate partnerships. Well, thanks for these questions. Great questions. Um, so to the first question, Joe Ford, um, I recognize, so I think maybe I haven't been as nuanced in my presentation as I am in the paper, um, but I recognize um, the possible value of engaging in ethical practices for a company and for a society, right? And so that's also what I talk about when I say instrumental value of ethics. It has effects that might be positive, that might be negative, but can be broadly positive. Um, the one question I ask in the paper is whether it's good enough to engage in ethical efforts only for instrumental reasons. So only for what ethics might lead to. Uh, instead of for ethics in itself 
as a valuable exercise for the participants in the exercise to enable them to better understand their position, their role, what they're doing, uh, formulate truths that might be helpful to society. But it's actually understanding ethics from the inside as a practice to be engaged in that is missing, I think, uh, from the way that ethics is used in corporate settings. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but um, that would be my pr pr primary response. And then obviously we could talk about it for ages. Um, to David, um, so how to think about an ethics that is free from corporate influence? Um, I do, I, I don't, so I don't necessarily want to say that companies should not get involved in the development of new technologies. Um, of course, that is impractical. Um, but I'm saying that a lot of what causes harm to individuals in the end, ultimately at the end of the production process, is perhaps an excessive influence of certain kinds of financial incentives into the process or some ways in which certain logics that are primarily capitalist logics get baked into the process of ethics and of the development of technology and end up resulting in the production of certain kinds of tech that we might not want or we might not have had otherwise. So I'm not saying that technology is bad per se, that we should not develop it and that companies should not get involved in the development of technologies, but I'm saying we need to rethink the pipeline and the practices and the incentives of actors in that pipeline um, and how each of them is being influenced by certain um, financial or other um, incentives that partly have to do with the way that corporations are structured um, and also are embedded in a larger context, obviously. And I'm not uh, saying that the evil guys are uh, either the CEOs or the companies themselves. I just think the problem is the system or the capital system as a whole. So I think my critique is pretty broad. Matt, I think there's a really interesting, um, uh, there's some really interesting work to be done just, just on the sociology of academic engagement with, uh, with tech companies. Because um, if we actually were to look at it in terms of, you know, who have tech companies been funding over the last 15 years? Well, obviously, first of all, um, artificial intelligence researchers, there's uh, about 7 million of those for every social scientist. But then even within the social sciences, um, you know, I can, I can count the number of uh, philosophers working in, with tech companies um, pretty much on the fingers of one hand. Um, whereas a lot of the major work in STS, in, in, in law, has actually been directly funded from, um, from these companies. So if we sort of actually looked at it in that light, from a purely sociological perspective, I think it would be quite interesting to see what the motivations are, whether companies have got what they wanted out of these kinds of interactions, um, which, which fields are doing the legitimating. Um, so next question from um, Atisa. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I wanted to a little bit uh, press you on this uh, criticism of moral philosophy and ethics. Uh, let's make them to be the same thing. So um, this, this, I mean, it seems to me that these disciplines are not like rigid, uh, rigid things and they're not like rigid kind of people who always have done the same thing. So in ethics, we have normative ethics, we have meta-ethics, and we have applied ethics. And there are people who move from normative ethics to applied ethics, so one very uh, good example is Peter Singer. So it seems to me that the problem is not really with the limits of moral philosophy. It's, it's like how we think about or what we take the moral philosophy to be. And so if we kind of adopt a very general perspective about what moral philosophy is, and that's what many ethicists of technology have done. So they do STS and they do moral philosophy. Then the limit would not really arise or the criticism would not really arise for moral philosophy, but it's more the way we do moral philosophy. Yeah. I completely agree with everything you've said. Um, so I've talked with many philosophers. I was a fellow in um, 
last year at the Center for Ethics at Harvard, and I was embedded in an environment uh, full of moral philosophers, so I had the chance to talk to many of them, and I've also obviously cultivated a strong interest in moral philosophy for, since forever, pretty much. Um, <laughs> But um, I think one of the really interesting kinds of reactions that I've got to this paper from philosophers was that I was trying to say that philosophers were political actors that were embedded in context and that therefore philosophy did not have objective universal applicability as a discipline um, and uh, was not something that we could just take as ground truth. Um, and I think, so, and my reaction to that was that I don't think philosophers take themselves to be formulating universal truths for everyone. Um, I think moral philosophers understand perfectly the limits of their work and the relativity of their conclusions and how possibly wrong they might be and how uh, everything is contestable by their colleagues who might write the exact opposite to what they're writing. And, and so I see them as in this dialogue that is exactly what you were describing about good philosophy. And yet very often when someone tries to say, oh, but there is a moral philosopher embedded at Apple, I don't believe, I don't want to take what they're saying as a ground truth because of where they are. And people respond, oh, but you're discrediting moral philosophy. And I want to say, no, I'm not discrediting moral philosophy as a discipline. I think there might be value to what that person is doing and saying. I just don't want to believe it as a political statement that will then have real world effects on people um, through the intermediary huge role of Apple. Um, in that equation, right? So, so I don't know if um, that responds to your question, but I think it's it's a tricky one in the sense that there's both kind of a something that philosophy has and is, you know, a specificity um, to it, and at the same time, it is kind of an exercise that is human and um, in the end is political. So I've got a question sort of channeling some of the stuff that um, has come up so far. Um, I've just got a first, a first point just about um, how we typically construe the nature of um, ethics in this context, which is just a, a comment and then a, another point about um, kind of the role of voluntary self-regulation. Um, so the point, the first point is just, um, actually, I think there's, some, there's an interesting parallel with some of the AI ethics stuff and some of the literature um, on the ethics of war. Um, in the following way. Um, so the ethics of war is typically taken to be divided into these two types of questions that you can ask. One is about the justice of resort to war as a whole, the justice of the war as a whole. Um, you know, whether you had a just cause, whether you had the right intention, proper authority, those sorts of things. And the other is about the means by which you fight, whether you are ensuring that um, you're not targeting civilians, whether you're, um, you're using only force that is necessary and proportionate. Um, and I think a lot of the discussions around AI ethics um, have been very much in the, in the realm of the second kind of question, discussion about the appropriate means to use, given that you're gonna do what you're gonna do with data and AI. Um, and that's you know, the sort of the formal constraints on fairness, for example, or explainability. Um, and fewer of the discussions that when, when ethics is talked about have to do with the questions of when ought you um, to use data in the first case, you know, when ought you to use AI, what are the purposes for which it's legitimate to use it, um, when is it appropriately authorized by the people whose data that you're using, say. Um, and, you know, they, both of those types of discussions have happened um, in the academic literature since day one, um, but only one type of discussion has really been sort of elevated and given prominence um, by the, um, the corporate partners, right? Because they obviously are much more interested in hearing about how, you know, how Google can develop ethics as a service, right? Which, as they've just done, um, you know, as distinct from sort of starting out with, you know, what ought we not use it for? Um, under what circumstances is gathering data, for example, inappropriate? Um, it's just a, a, more, a more challenging question for the corporate partner. So just that little analogy is the first part. The second part is, um, 
you know, often I think that even the, even the bashing of corporate ethics, um, so sort of setting aside the, the frustrating use of terminology um, uh, of the word ethics to mean using it to when it really means voluntary self-regulation, but using it in a way that sort of criticizes the whole field of, of research that's been going back since you know, Aristotle and before. Um, but even the criticism of corporate ethics, I think, um, is naive about the way in which we achieve kind of beneficial social outcomes generally, um, because it relies on putting everything into the law. Like everyone's like, we need regulation. Right? It's like, yeah, we need regulation, absolutely. Um, but you also need to have um, good responsible practices. You know, we need to regulate doctors, um, but we also need um, professional codes and prof codes of professional practice. Um, because otherwise you're going to get really bad outcomes because you can't legislate for everything. Um, and the, the law should provide a, a minimum standard of conduct. Um, and we generally want to go much beyond that. So I guess I do think um, that there are um, genuine benefits to having um, you know, like robust codes of practice that exceed what the law requires. Um, I think we can walk and chew gum. You know, I think that we should be advocating for regulation um, while at the same time making sure that we establish um, positive soft norms. Um, I do think that one of the errors that has been made by a lot of these um, sort of codes of practice is that um, they put into a code of practice what they sort of norms that cover conduct that is already provided for by the law. Um, so I think if you if you seek a code of practices in some way supplanting, replacing the law, um, then, then that's a problem. And some of these AI ethics codes, um, including our one here in Australia, um, has, have done that. Um, they've made it look as though it's a matter of aspirational conduct, where really it's like, no, oh, you, you have to do that. <laughs> some of them even have like, you know, act in accordance with the law as part of the, um, one of their principles. It's like, yeah, you have to do that anyway. Like the law is something you have to follow. Um, it's not an extra sort of aspirational principle. So anyway, the, the, the two parts of the thought then, one is it's a means ends distinction is also important. And the other is there will always be a role for, um, for some element of codes of practice, soft norms, um, as well as um, hard laws. Um, and that's all. Can I respond? There are comments, but I'll, I'll respond briefly. To say I completely agree with the use in bellum, use, sorry, in ad bellum, in bello um, distinction. Um, and I do think, and actually I think it connects very well with the self-regulation comment, um, because I do think uh, we need to think of moral philosophy as a tool, as a methodology, as I've said, um, that allows us to move beyond what we have today, right? Um, and so I agree that we need a mix of regulatory practices. We need the state to potentially oversee certain things. We need companies to behave in certain ways. We need international uh, bodies or NGOs to play particular roles. We need academia to also be active. Um, so there are roles for different actors and all of these actors um, can be theorized in a variety of ways. And I think philosophy has a role to play in rethinking all of these structures and all of these contexts within which all of these players are um, acting in shaping the technologies that we have. Um, whether or not I'm completely in favor of codes of conduct and self-regulation, um, not necessarily, but not necessarily. So I'm not committed against codes of conduct and codes of practice. But for example, in relation to questions such as disinformation in Europe, um, the approach has been a code of conduct. And I think the result of having um, something like a code of conduct or for example something like the facebook oversight board which is a completely self-regulatory initiative that facebook has kind of decided to undertake funding it and taking huge steps uh, to make it work which are admirable um 
is that somehow it's maintaining a level of debate on governance that remains completely dependent on pre-existing actors. Um, so we are assuming that the people who will have a role to play in misinformation or who will have a role to play in content moderation on Facebook are Facebook plus uh, Twitter, Google, and whoever else has signed uh, the code on misinformation. So I'm talking about two different things, right? The, the Facebook oversight board and the code of uh, practice on disinformation. But overall, it leads to an understanding of governance that is pretty limited because it relies on pre-existing paradigms and on incumbents. And I think that what philosophy can allow us to do is actually take a step back and say, and actually act more as a critical methodology, um, like sociology, like anthropology, and allow us to think about why we need those companies in the first place. Do we really need them? What do we need them for? And what else, what other kinds of worlds can we imagine where we would have more competitors fulfilling those roles, or governments fulfilling some of those roles, or consumers, consumer organizations, or bottom-up governance um, performing some of those tasks, right? And so, so I do think we need to rethink uh, a lot of our uh, governance structures, and I, so I, I do want to see more philosophy in, in that kind of capacity. Um, so, yeah. um, well, I'm going to throw to Sylvie just in a moment. Um, I should say that um, to the audience that Electra has a paper, um, I, I know, which explores, does exactly some of that work that you were just describing, um, and uh, which I heartily encourage um, everybody to, to read. I'm sure it's available from um, one of your websites or, or pages. Um, Sylvie, if you wouldn't mind asking the last question for us. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure my question is is really, uh, you know, super related to your talk, but I, I'll try to formulate it and ask it anyway. So you talked about a little bit, well, I should say before I'm a computer scientist. Uh, uh, all right, so you, you talk about uh, the limits of uh, ethics and about, you know, how to make the best use of, um, of ethics in, uh, in developing, uh, you know, AI systems. I mean, you, you talked a little bit about this. Um, and so, um, yeah, I want you to ask a question about this. And I'm not, not uh, about, yeah, the best way of ethicists and computer scientists collaborating together to, to build AI systems that, um, you know, are morally acceptable. And I'm, I'm not interested in, um, in, you know, the, you know, so I'm not focusing on, you know, corporation building AI systems. I'm more focusing on, let's say, a project like, like ours which is uh, done at university level. So you said, and I kind of, uh, I, I agree that a lot of ethics is seen as very abstract. So that's my, you know, that's my uh, perception that either you have very abstract, uh, you know, theories, or you also have uh, philosophers that have, um, you know, excellent at analysis of, analyzing a very, very concrete situation. But what's missing is a bit what's at the middle. And it's problematic because a lot of AI systems are made of components that are between these two levels where we're trying to have algorithms that solve a class of problems. And so basically my question is, what do you think would need to happen for, um, for this gap to be, to be bridged? Uh, to, to bring, to basically have, be able to, to understand what needs to be represented in these algorithms to, you know, to capture um, uh, the ethics of the situation at hand, but, uh, you know, at a kind of mid-level. Sorry, I'm, it's very difficult to articulate my question, but I hope uh, some people... Uh, got it and if you don't well that's all right we, we can see no, i think you did a very good job and i think it's a very interesting and good question um so actually today i was at a talk on um where they were talking about uh, a multidisciplinary group of computer scientists and lawyers who came together to talk about privacy tools and one of the things that they discuss uh regularly like once every two weeks is uh, differential privacy and how it could be used to um, entrench privacy defaults in uh, structures that are technological structures, but also policy more generally. 
And so I thought, like, I think that that is a good example um, to think about how lawyers and computer scientists can interact and what, um, yeah, so how to think about kind of that interface, right? And I think my, my first response to your question is that I think we need to uh, clarify why we are using a certain type of tool. So why do we need differential privacy, for example? Uh, why do we need encryption in certain circumstances? I think it's great that computer scientists are working on developing certain new technologies, but when it comes to policy, when it comes to real world implications, I think people need to come together and ask the normative questions of what are these technologies actually performing? What are they doing for us? And I think uh, actually both lawyers and computer scientists can be very bad at this because lawyers have a tendency to say, oh, this is what the law says. Mm -hmm. So this is the standard of privacy that is required by law. And so what computer scientists should do is just match that requirement of privacy, right? But it might be the case that the law itself is very watered down and is a minimal standard that needs to be uh, increase significantly in future laws, right? But what happens is that once uh, the technical standard has become a certain kind of privacy standard, it's really difficult for the community to change that standard. Um, so I think that's where ethics should come into play to scrutinize also the law itself and prevent the interaction of say lawyers and computer scientists uh, from being a purely status quo view of the world, but actually trying to unite every discipline to move beyond current paradigms in trying to make the world better for everyone, right? And obviously it's a completely idealized vision of the world that I have as an academic that I'm allowed to have as an academic. Um, but I do think that there are risks in those cross-disciplinary synergies um, if everyone thinks of their discipline as kind of static or, or the other one as, as static. So if, if a computer scientist thinks of the law as a static thing and the lawyer thinks of computer science and like an algorithm as a thing that cannot change and each of these people kind of taking things as, 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 as given. Uh, instead of thinking together about how to change. Now, I completely agree with you. In fact, uh, we also have uh, a number of lawyers in our, our, in our project, like uh, Will. And uh, every time we, when we're having conversation, I'm, I'm finding myself thinking, oh, but we should change this. And, you know, like, uh, so I completely agree that the, one of the issues is that people uh, take, uh, you know, uh, even their side and, and, and the other side for granted and uh, that we need to elevate ourselves together. Thanks. Um, that's a, a lovely point to finish on. Um, so let me just encourage folks who didn't get to ask their questions to jump over into the Slack channel and ask them there and Electra will be um, hopping over there as well to answer some questions. I actually, Sylvie, I just um, put, put the one you, you mentioned up there and put a little comment on it. Um, and um, look, for now, let's all thank Electra for uh, a wonderful talk and for joining us that evening in, um, in Harvard. Um, thank you, Electra. That was great.